We have Daniel Sherman on hand, who will examine how the decisions we make as individuals have environmental impacts and how our choices are oftentimes constrained and shaped by government policies. This talk will illustrate the ways that such policies shape our individual and collective environmental impacts, and he'll reflect on the ways that individual actions can influence the adoption of future environmental policies. Let me talk just a bit about our format for the evening. I'm going to introduce Daniel with his biography in just a second, and then he will uh, take over and talk for approximately 40 minutes or so, and then we will have questions and answers uh, on the talk. You can type them in in the chat box, and I will read them aloud to Daniel after his talk concludes, and it should be a fun one. So without any further ado, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, Daniel, Daniel Sherman is the loose funded professor of environmental policy and decision making and director of the Sound Policy Institute. He studies the role individuals and groups play in environmental politics, policy and sustainability. His new textbook with Norton Books, Environmental Science and Sustainability, many of you here in the audience tonight are using this book, co-authored with Dave Montgomery, presents a new approach to environmental science that helps students discover their role in the environment and the impact of their choices. I'm sure he'll be interested to hear your views on this tonight. <laughs> Sherman's first book, Not Here, Not There, Not Anywhere, Politics, Social Movements, and the Disposal of Low-Level Radioactive Waste, examines the contentious politics of waste disposal implementation at all levels of government in the United States and the dynamics of mobilized opposition in local communities. In addition to writing and teaching about environmental politics and policy, he also teaches, writes, and facilitates workshops on sustainability efforts in higher education. His article, Sustainability, What's the Big Idea? and Uncovering Sustainability in the Curriculum speak to efforts to integrate sustainability broadly across the curriculum. And without any further ado, sermon. Yeah, thanks for that great introduction, John. You know what? It's nice to be in Texas again, even if virtually I used to live in South Texas many years ago in Corpus Christi. And I actually really miss the music and the food, the beach, the weather <laughs> in the springtime. <laughs> but tonight I'm here in my empty classroom in Tacoma, Washington at the University of Puget Sound. I took a job here 17 years ago to build an environmental program and at that time, I remember our, our environmental science faculty, we were, we were worried that our lessons on how Earth works and human environmental impacts left our students feeling distant and even a little bit depressed and disempowered. And at that same time, I was put on a sustainability committee to green the campus. And the folks working in that area on our facilities had a similar concern that the students were seeing sustainability efforts as just a long list of things individuals could do, and they weren't convinced that those actions would actually make much of a difference. So we decided here to, to build an environmental science curriculum around policy and decision making as a higher leverage point for individual engagement and empowerment. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Individual green actions are important, but they should be just the start. Our real potential for impact comes when we shape the policies that govern behaviors on a much larger scale. So, like John said, in more recent years, I've worked on an environmental science and sustainability textbook, which I just heard that some of you are using with my co-author, Dave Montgomery, at the University of Washington. And I also want to say that um, Brian Schmafsky at uh, Lone Star Kingwood also helped us develop some really fantastic interactive decision making exercises for that book that are really cool. So thanks to Brian for that. So what what we've learned teaching environmental science with this is that is that students are often aware of and feel the urgency of environmental problems often quite intensely. I mean, you can look at Gallup polling on this and see that for Americans ages 18 to 34, 70% say they worry about global warming affair to a great amount. 
the challenge for teaching and learning environmental science is, is how to help us all situate ourselves in the midst of this urgency. So on the one hand, we need environmental science, you know, a basic understanding of scientific inquiry, how Earth works, how our well-being depends on the environment, how our actions affect the environment. But we also really need a teaching and learning that helps us engage more critically and effectively as environmental decision makers. So that's what we try to do with this book. I've got three parts for my talk tonight, three unequal parts. The first half of the talk will be part one. I'm going to look at just um, to impress upon us all that individual environmental actions do matter, but they're there are many ways they're constrained by forces that are larger than ourselves, most notably policies. Then part two, we'll consider some problems that emerge when we focus too narrowly on individual actions. And then finally, briefly in part three, look at some ways to exert leverage over the policymaking process. Part one, so our individual environmental impacts are real. Don't, don't interpret my talk as uh, anything other than that. Usually you would see a slide like this at the end of a presentation, like the kind of what can you do part of the presentation, but I'm gonna flip it and start with this point and then dig deeper. So yes, I mean, our individual choices really do matter. Each of us lives in an environment. We make our living off of the environment. So of course, our choices that we make, the actions we take have consequences and we can choose and act to make more or less of an environmental impact. And most of us have been made well aware of this. And, um, you know, at least for the last 50 years since the first Earth Day, there have been many awareness raising campaigns like this, like this slide here about saving the Earth or saving the planet and 10 things you can do. I just chose one from the World Wildlife Fund just as an example. And on the bottom there, you can see uh, four of the prescribed action categories, you know, um, travel responsibly, drive and fly less, walk, cycle, take public transportation, et cetera, eat sustainably, eating less meat and animal products, more plant-based diet, choosing organic and local food, reducing waste, consuming and wasting less to begin with, reusing things as long as we can and recycling, and then watching what we buy by trying to buy sustainably produced goods and services. Um, and, you know, doing these things can add up and they can add up, especially when lots of people are doing them. And one thing that can really help with that, moving from just us as individuals to more of a collective, are impact tracking programs that can make this visible. So this is something here. These are some screenshots from something called the Eco Challenge that I, I work on with my students. And on the left there are just some examples of hundreds of environmental actions that you can choose from that are very specific. And they're put in terms of goals, you know, that, that can be counted. And then what happens is as you do them, it keeps track of what your impact is. And then on the right, what I have there is it also keeps track of your entire group, what the impact is. So this is just a snapshot of one day, you know, keeping track of what my class had been up to and seeing, you know, the different, um, the different impacts accumulating. So it can be helpful to make visible um, um, this sort of thing. In our everyday life recently, um, many of us witnessed feedback on how individual actions add up to a significant collective impact just when we notice changes in air quality and traffic around us um, during the initial months of the COVID-19 pandemic. So on the left there, you have a photo of empty freeways and clear skies around LA. And I remember um, during these months, I used my car so little that I needed my battery jumped because it died. I hadn't started my car um, frequently enough. But on the right, there's more serious um, analysis that's, that's in the journal Nature Climate Change um, this past May. And it found a 17% reduction globally in daily global CO2 emissions by early April when compared with 2019. 
And most of this reduction was due to changes in individual transportation. So, you know, there's a real world example of individual actions adding up. A couple of years back in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out this report on what it would take to keep global warming to not surpass a degree and a half Celsius. And um, their findings highlighted the role individuals' behaviors would need to play to achieve these goals. And um, some of the, the behaviors that they called out had to do with transportation, home heating and cooling, and diet. Now, this was only part of the report, but it was really the part of the report that caught fire in the news. So this is just one news outlet, CNN, but several outlets picked up on this. And the way they reported the story was... Um, this is important, this is urgent, here are some ways to do it, and it, it boiled it down to individual actions, like you can see there in that tweet from CNN, eating less meat and transportation choices and so forth. So this is kind of the way the story shook out. And as way of a transition, I'm going to offer a joke here, um, because it reminded me of something, a joke from a 1980s stand-up comic routine by Stephen Wright that went something like this. I'm not gonna, gonna do him justice, but so he was joking that when he was a kid, he heard the famous Smokey the Bear television ad designed to prevent forest fires with the famous tagline, only you can prevent forest fires. And he joked that when he was a kid, he took this literally. So he thought it was really only up to him, and he started sneaking out of his bedroom window with buckets of water every night, convinced that he had to put out all of the forest fires. So um, while it's important to take the prescribed actions to prevent forest fires or whatever problem we're concerned about, obviously it's not all up to us as individuals. There are larger forces at work here too, and that's what I wanna direct our attention to. So if we go back to this IPCC report, there was a lot more in that report besides just individual actions. And this is, this is evident in the, the tweet storm reaction to the CNN tweet, which I tried to capture here with this screenshot. So this is an environmental journalist, Kate Aronoff, responding to that tweet. And you see what she's doing here is she's reacting to the prescription for individual actions and saying, essentially look at bigger forces, which is, which is my point and bring it in here and look at things like the state or the government, look at what companies are doing, look at the economy. And in fact, if we look at the actual report, it actually was trying to draw attention, not only to individual actions, but it said that institutions are gonna, are gonna have a lot of influence over the viability of the pathways, you know, that it would take to reach this, this limit on global warming. So what are, what are institutions? Um, well, the definition that I like to use is that there are systems beyond the individual level that organize and standardize our patterns of social behavior. Um, they're um, rules of the game um, in which we operate that include things like, well, universities or corporations, governments, economic systems, legal systems. So in other words, our individual choices and actions are constrained by these larger forces. And to bring this back down to earth, my students quickly realize this when they pursue those eco challenges that I showed earlier in the slideshow. Um, for example, when they try to reduce energy consumption for heating, many of them find that there's no adjustable thermostats in their dorm rooms. So even in the wintertime, sometimes they end up having to cool their room by opening windows and wasting energy. Um, when they try to find more local and organic options in the dining hall, they find that the university's dining service is bound by a contract with a food service provider that has limited options. Or when they want to reduce food waste in the dining hall by using their own reusable to-go containers or by diverting leftovers to food banks, they've been constrained by county food handling regulations. 
So just with those three examples, using less energy to heat your room, eating more sustainably, reducing your waste is more complicated than just taking an individual action, really. It might involve institutional changes to the university, to the Food Service Corporation, working with county government. So now what I'm gonna do is draw extra special attention to these last two types of institutions, corporations and government. And first, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at greenhouse gas emissions as an example. So if we think back to the 10 things you can do to save the planet, we know that one of the things we're supposed to do is travel responsibly, which means choosing modes that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is because fossil fuels are the largest source of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And these greenhouse gas emissions come from the extraction, the production, and the consumption of these fuels. And in the climate accounting world, these are all lumped together as industrial greenhouse gas emissions. So a critical question here is who should be accountable for these emissions? Well, there's a group um, that's been working on this called the, the Climate Accountability Institute that wanted to flip things and do kind of a different view on this accountability question. And what they did was provide a producer side view of the emissions by highlighting the role that just the 100 most emission heavy fossil fuel producing corporations have played in the production of, of these gases and these climate impacts. So the way they did this was what they gathered um, each company's production records for various types of fuel like coal, gas, and oil. And then they used the IPCC emission formulas um, to come up with the calculations. So let's look at this. So what they found is that since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, which they peg at 17, the year 1751, just 100 corporations have been responsible for 52% of industrial greenhouse gas emissions. One of the reasons that this percentage is so high is that we've generated such a large share of these emissions in recent decades. So you try carefully to follow me here. So in the years since 1988, so just a few decades, and 1988 is chosen because it's a year in which people became widely aware of climate change. So since 1988, there have been more tons of global industrial greenhouse gas emissions than in the 237 years from 1751 to 1988. So then if we look at that, that largest share from 1988, 100 companies, the 100 top companies have been responsible for more than 70% of these emissions. And then they go one more step and they boil it down to, well, let's just look at the 25 top fossil fuel emitting corporations since 1988. And they're responsible for just over half of these emissions. So it's a different way of, of looking at it beyond the individual consumer. So let me turn now to just a different environmental issue to give you another example that makes the same point. We think about biodiversity. So the World Wildlife Fund works on biodiversity and they have um, what I think is a really effective and creative strategy that they developed over the past 15 years or so. And it's, it's a where, what, who strategy to protect biodiversity. So on the left there is the where. So first they, just, so they said, let's, let's just identify the places where biodiversity is richest and most important from an ecosystem function perspective. And they came up with these 36 places on this map on the left. And then when they started to examine these places and uh, the threats to them, what they found was that the same commodity production was affecting lots of these places. So then they, they decided to group these together and found that 14 commodities posed the biggest risk to these places. 
And then you can work up from there, which is what they did. And they found the companies that controlled the largest share of trade in these commodities and put them in a group and identified um, 100 companies that through their, their holdings and their actions had the biggest impact on these priority places that they wanted to protect. And their reasoning for this strategy was that it would be easier to work with and on 100 companies than it would be to try to work with over seven and a half billion consumers and you know how many different um, you know other entities to try and make this happen. So now, of course, consumers can act on corporations affecting demand for products from the bottom up, and, and we're familiar with how that works. But let's not forget that governments can influence corporate behavior and practices in a multitude of ways from the top down. And I wanna um, build our imagination for that. So I'm gonna take us back to this top 100 greenhouse gas emitting companies, which is here. I guess I could play this as a a little animation while I talk. This shows kind of the change over time of how these companies grew. I don't know how well you can see this happening. Are they moving? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, if you look at these companies and, and you think about who they are and where they are, you can imagine, brainstorm possible policy leverage points that either exist now or could exist in the future. So Obviously, you could think about pollution control regulations on the extraction, production, or consumption. You can think about policy instruments like um, carbon taxes or um, cap and trade programs that have been talked about and some places have implemented. Um, thinking more at the state level, something that has happened, you could think about funding or other support for alternative energy. So 29 states plus Washington DC have, have renewable energy portfolio standards that actually force utilities to meet certain thresholds for shares of power provided by alternative energy. Um, thinking even more creatively about ways that policies um, in government government policies get involved in in these corporations you can think about the the massive um, state pension plans and how they are invested you know in companies so last month california developed a climate investment framework to guide investment in its three largest state pension plans and then finally if i go back here if we can look You'll notice that some of these companies are partially or wholly state-owned, right? As Saudi Aramco, Gazprom is in Russia, the National Iranian Oil Company. Um, here's Venezuela down here, China. Um, so obviously their own governments could act directly on them, but also um, foreign policy is a policy that can influence, you know, what, what these corporations do and, and trade policy as well. So I provide these examples as a way of training ourselves to see higher leverage points for change beyond just um, beyond just uh, what was it? Travel responsibly, I think, was the the what to do to to save the planet. And in fact, that IPCC report that I keep talking about recognized that governance is going to play a major role if we're gonna make any success towards limiting global warming. And that's because of policies. Policies are the decisions adopted by authorities to influence behavior. And they, they shape our behavior by influencing our knowledge and resources that are behind all of the, the choices that we make. So in other words, our individual actions are downstream from governance and that, that's because of policy. So my next, just, just to switch up the issues that I'm talking about here, my next set of examples, because I want to dig into like, like what, what kinds of policies shape our knowledge? What kinds of policies shape our resources? 
So I'm going to choose the um, the eat sustainably um, admonition from that list. Eat sustainably, just one of the individual actions. And I'm going to make a really messy slide. It's going to be hard to look at when we're all done. But on the left, let me. See. I think I have a blank one first. That's not so hard to look at. On the left, I'm going to be putting policies that shape knowledge related to our food choices. And then on the right, I'm going to put policies that shape resources. So think about policies that shape knowledge that affect our food choices. Wow, all this stuff. OK, so education in a general way, we know that education policy is much. A lot of education is public, not not just public K through 12, but higher education, too. And in general, education policy influences everything from funding priorities to curriculum assessment standards. So in a general way, it can shape scientific and environmental and media literacy. But in a more targeted way to food, the USDA has developed curricula that it uses uh, and technical assistance that it, it sends to schools based mostly around nutrition, not too much about sustainability. But you can see some states like um, the, my own state where I'm living now, Washington, has a farm to school program that links food procurement to the curriculum and school gardens and local farms and kind of builds nutrition in with sustainability. That's kind of cool. Moving across the top there, PSAs are public service annou announcements that are often funded or supported by government that are just awareness raising campaigns. There's one on food waste there. Um, public pronouncements, um, uh, directives, guidance, publicity from public officials. I just put the Obama's school lunch and gardening initiative in here because they can have some influence as well. A really big one is research and risk analysis because we rely on government policies to fund and direct research on environmental harms. And so we know what to trust and assess the risk for us. So there's a little image of the EPA research on the safety of uh, an insecticide called chlorpyrifos, which is used on lots of um, food crops. So that shapes our food choices, um, th these risk analyses and decisions made by agencies like that, as do the certifications down there under consumer information, like knowing what's been grown organically and nutrition recommendations or other kinds of recommendations um, that governments provide. So that's all just, just things shaping our knowledge. I'm sure you could think of more examples as well. And if we move to resources, policies shape the resources available in any decision-making context. So the way this works is that the application or withholding of resources sets the incentives under which we operate. So incentives can pull us towards or push us away certain behaviors by shaping how we perceive costs and benefits. So in terms of food choices, they can make things um, more expensive or more affordable. Um, and sometimes it's useful, probably not so much in this context, but sometimes it's useful to think of resources in terms of time as well. Anyway, let's, let's load up the right side of the screen now with policies shaping resources affecting our food choices. So we can think of direct food assistance through SNAP, also known as food stamps, the program that provides um, assistance, a debit card really for, for low income households to purchase food. So sustainably speaking, this program has been enhanced when state and local governments have provided matching funds when it's used at farmers markets is a really good program in where I live here in Tacoma that that doubles the SNAP provision if it's used at a farmer's market. Also supports local farms that way too. Um, but direct payments are also made through agricultural subsidies, which is the next picture on the top on the far right there. So nearly 40% of US farms receive some form of federal subsidy. It could be direct payments, most are, it could be subsidized loans or crop insurance. And for many types of fruit and vegetable crops, the government authorizes producers to 
well, to essentially collude to set set prices um, with things called marketing orders. So these are things that, that directly affect the price of food to us when we go to buy it. So the question is, how could crop subsidies or marketing orders be adjusted to encourage sustainable farming? Moving down, see that um, there's federal trade inspection and transportation policies that affect the relative cost of foods that are grown and shipped long distances and you know will affect how well they compete with local producers that's something to think about environmental regulations over agriculture most environmental re regulations are actually implemented at the state level and i guess what i want to point out here is that um regulations for for well the more lax the regulations the cheaper the product would be that produces pollution okay as a kind of coarse way to think about this relative to the product whose producer takes steps to reduce pollution so regulations affect the cost in the end rural land use is important whether or not a state has land use planning and zoning laws that preserve farmland can influence the availability of farm products close to population centers and then urban planning, which is urban land use policies, shape what food availability is like in a population center. Um, is there fresh produce available in every neighborhood or are there some neighborhoods where you pretty much rely on a mini mart or fast food? So consider these just a sampling, you know, from the universe of policy leverage points that that can influence something that seems like a deeply personal choice of what to eat. And again, consider ourselves what we're doing right now is just training ourselves to see higher leverage points in policy that might shape our actions. So moving on to part two, finally, right? What is the problem with a narrow focus on individual actions? Why do we need to think beyond our individual actions and impacts? Well, I think there's, there's some important problems to think about here. So one, just in a general sense with my crude diagram on the left there is you know, environmental problems are big and complex and often global in scale. So, and think of climate change, for example. So jumping from problems of this magnitude to solutions at the micro level of individual behavior is really a mismatch of scale and imagination. So why do we do this? Why do we prescribe primarily individualized solutions to massive problems without looking at larger, more systemic leverage points? I think we do it because we think it's empowering um, and we want to be able to make a difference. You know, we want to know something that we can control or change. Um, I also think sometimes that we do it because we want to lay claim to a kind of virtue or absolution that comes from following some simple rules and even a, a darker side here and being able to distinguish ourselves from people who don't follow these rules possibly. Yeah, unfortunately, as a strategy of positive development and change, this can fail in several ways. Um, so on the right of the slide, those three bullets are some ways that it can fail. Focusing exclusively on individual actions can actually be disempowering sometimes. So because the individual actions that we take can be individually disruptive sometimes and costly in time and money, um, and they might not amount to much on their own over a short period of time, um, people can become discouraged. So if I go back to the story of greenhouse gas reductions during the COVID-19 pandemic, the early months, right? Another way to tell that story is that the decline was only 17% globally. And that that came due to the most costly disruption most of us have known in our lifetime. And that brought greenhouse gas emissions down to 2006 levels. So it's, it's not inconsequential, it's great. But if one dwells on that, you know, when balancing your everyday costs and benefits and stress, it's easy to see 
how you could go from thinking I'm doing my part because it adds up to make a dif difference to why should I bother? And that is the emotional defense mechanism to difficult situations that psychologists call resignation. And that's disempowering. Making individual actions a matter of virtue can lead to demotivating shame. And it can also play into polarizing culture wars. So establishing prescribed environmental actions as virtuous and you know, non-actions or other actions is, I don't know, sinful, I guess. It defines and dehumanizes people as good or bad based on simplistic rules of behavior. And this can trigger strong emotions of shame. So if we hold ourselves to this standard and direct that shame inward, what it can do, psychologists would tell you, is have a really paralyzing effect, which brings us back to resignation. Um, not to mention it takes all the fun out of trying to live sustainably. <laughs> um, but when we project shame on others, it can lead to denial, anger, outrage, outsized opposition. These are all other emotional defense mechanisms to challenging situations that we've become all too familiar with in the polarized politics of today. Either way, it's a demotivating force. And then that last bullet there, this is curious. There's some situations psychologists have found where an outsized focus on individual actions can, can in certain circumstances lead to an overestimation of their impact. So we make doing one thing so important that people actually give themselves license to have greater impacts in other areas. And so I can point you towards experiments where People have done a really great job and, and been taught and trained how to use less water, and then they end up using a lot less electricity somehow. Or they give lots of money to an environmental cause and take that as a license to drive a lot more. Um, so it, it could come out as a wash or worse. So, you know, that's, that's just another reason to be wary of, of, a, of too narrow a focus here. But let's think bigger here about problems. So what all of the consequences I'm talking about, they, um, they distract us from the leverage we can have to make larger scale changes. And they assume without questioning that we're gonna continue acting within a status quo system that makes it really difficult to achieve the necessary large scale change. And I think, you know, maybe the most troubling thing for me is that they, um, this exclusive focus on individual actions can make the terrible assumption that we all have the same ability to choose sustainable actions when that's not true. And that ignores inequality. We don't all have the same environmental impact. We don't all have the same resources to take these prescribed environmental actions. And we don't all bear the same environmental burdens. Well, let's talk about this a little bit more. So it's not as though um, we all have the same environmental impact. It's not as though each person on earth is responsible for a single share of the collective human impact. And what this study shows here in the gray and the black is that the richest 10% of the world's population is responsible for more than half of the cumulative carbon emissions between 1990 and 2015. And if we think about this other thing in the title line here, nor do we have all the same resources at our disposal to take the prescribed environmental actions. So if you think about the folks down here in the world, do they, does, does everyone really have an equal ability to pay for organic produce or have equal access to farmers markets to buy local or have the resources and time and money that it takes to plan and cook meals in ways that reduce food waste? It's clearly not. It's clearly not equal. The assumption that we're all equal decision makers looks past systemic environmental injustice and racism that's operating within the status quo. And these are inequities that are built over generations that cause disparate environmental harms, inequitable distribution of environmental amenities according to race, ethnicity, 
gender and income. And we don't all bear the same environmental burdens. The disparate environmental health risks in COVID-19 has laid this bare recently, laid these inequalities bare, when black Americans are dying at twice the rate of white Americans from this disease. And the systemic factors driving this tragedy are not new. This is not explained by individual actions increasing risk. This is a longer, deeper, more troubling story about things like historic segregation in housing and education, which is the result of systemic racism. That's a critical determinant of economic status, which then is a strong predictor of health. Um, you can look at other things that came out on the on the right here is, is an article that kind of catalogs all these things in the, the Journal of the American Medical Association. People of color are overrepresented among essential service workers who had little choice but to work outside the home, often relying on public transportation during shelter in place orders. And compounding risk factors like disparate access to affordable health care, elevated air and water pollution, chronic stress, all lead to more chronic disease risk, which leads to greater susceptibility to COVID-19. So this article on the right that chronicles all of this kind of does a little wordplay with herd immunity. And it argues that what we need is kind of a new kind of herd immunity that addresses these inequalities in a systematic way so that what we're doing as a whole, as a whole population is that we're developing resistance to the spread of poor health generally, not just COVID-19 and for everyone. And that's, that's in contrast to just the individual behaviors that we hear about and that we know and that are the right thing to do, like wearing a mask and, you know, um, staying out of crowded indoor spaces and all these things. But thinking bigger from that, thinking in a more systemic way to how to address um, these concerns, which brings us back to policy, because policies shape these things. And let's look at the role that we can play in it and move to the, the final part three of my talk here. So how we can gain leverage over the status quo and address um, the heart of the problem. So policy and you, how do we move ourselves upstream? So to recognize our full potential and exert leverage over decision-making, we need to Think of ourselves as more than just consumers. Many of these prescribed environmental actions put us in the role of consumer. And consumers are by definition participating at the end or near the end of a process. So while we do make important environmental decisions as consumers, you know, and please keep it up, um, we do so primarily as individuals in a context that's largely isolated. And the context is determined upstream of us and the most powerful decisions upstream of us are policies. So how do we move ourselves upstream? So now I'm in the, I'm sorry, I'm subjecting you to salmon here because I'm in the Pacific Northwest and I've been spending all semester teaching about salmon. Um, so you're gonna get a lot of salmon pictures because my metaphor is we're moving upstream. So um, how do we do that? So let's start with voting, okay? And this is admittedly curious. It may seem strange to start with an individual action like voting um, after everything that I've just said. But as you'll see, I don't want us to think of voting merely as something that happens at one moment in time or that's a solitary activity. So um, when you're voting, you're not actually a consumer. I'll talk more about that in a second. I want us to think more of voting as a process that requires planning rather than just an instant. And I want us to think that uh, beyond voting, uh, voting as being more than just a solitary activity. So voters are not consumers. Um, you're not merely a customer of the government. Actually, you should think of yourself as the boss in elections. Voting in elections is a question of who you're going to hire. Um, rather than something that you're going to consume. And the candidates are not perpetually competing companies. 
the winner gets the job and goes on to make policies that govern our lives and the losers are out of power for now. And let's talk about voting as a process now. So I think we get hung up by thinking that voting is something that happens on a day. And I think instead we should think that this is voting month right now. And it takes, it might take a process and some planning to do it. So let me start by talking about turnout, um, which as you may know, voting turnout amongst the voting age population in the US is notoriously low compared to other countries. You see this on the left here. It's even lower um, for those in the 18 to 29 year old demographic where in this election, this was 2016, only 46% of those in that age group voted compared to 71% of those 65 years and older. You can look here, voting goes down, voting turnout goes down in midterm elections compared to presidential elections. It's lower still in primaries lower still in state and local elections that don't run concurrently with national elections. In fact, the elections that determine most of the offices in the U.S. do not coincide with national elections. And since lots of environmental decisions fall to state and local governments, these elections really matter. So um, there's a reason for this. There's a reason turnout's low, and that's because it's not necessarily easy to vote for everyone. So we need to think of it as something that takes some planning as to the when, where, and how you will vote. So what psychologists have found, and you might have heard a lot about this recently, the, the kind of make a plan approach to voting, is what psychologists have found is that when they encourage people to articulate for themselves a plan of when, where, and how they will vote, this, this psychologists call this implementation intentions. This works for just exercise as well. You know, lots of activities, not just voting. But when you articulate a plan, you're more likely to actual follow through in, in voting, that means turnout. So it can increase turnout by over four percentage points. And what does making a plan entail? One of the difficult things, especially for that younger demographic, is actually registering to vote. Uh, it's not uncommon for, for younger people to actually have kind of three or more residences where they've recently lived. And because uh, voting laws vary by state, and over 10,000 local districts in the U.S. administer voting in various ways, it can be pretty complicated. So. I like to point my students towards this fair election center. My students live all over the country and it's easy to go to the state and figure out, you know, what you need to do there and, and follow the steps. Um, so knowing when and where you'll vote, and just to bring this back to Salmon again, so um, get the timing right. Salmon come back at a particular time if it's an odd year here, I know that the pink salmon are going to be coming back and go to your local streams. They come back to their local streams, you know, and vote. Uh, well, actually, they come back to spawn, but we're talking about voting. Go to your local streams, get the timing right. And now let's talk about how you will vote here. First, there's just the mechanics of how you vote. Don't uh, read the directions. Don't spoil your ballot. There were over 200,000 spoiled ballots in 2016. Um, this is just an example of a voting guide and that you might find groups um, that you trust more um, for support, but voting guides exist. And why voting guides are great is that they actually track how office holders vote. And um, for candidates who aren't yet in office, they'll have their policy positions there too. And you can sort of see how that works over time. Since we're talking about environmental things here, I use the, the League of Conservation vote. So you could get a scorecard for your state representatives, or you could go to, you know, every state uh, office has one of these organizations, and you can look at the National House or Senate as well. But the other thing I wanted to point out here is because they keep these scores on the right, 
you can see changes over time. So these are the accumulated scores for all the senators in the solid line and all the representatives in the dotted line over the years. The higher the score, the more environmentally friendly the votes on balance were. And majorities matter. So when it goes over 50%, that's really important in terms of the policies passed. And I just want to say it doesn't necessarily always track party affiliation. If you go back here, it's very mixed, by the way, by party affiliation. But elections matter, I guess is what I want to point out. So you can see the last midterm election took both the Senate and the House over 50% in terms of environmentally friendly um, votes. Okay. The salmon switch swim stream together, not alone. So my salmon picture is changing. So um, don't just think of yourself as casting one vote. Ask yourself how you can multiply your impact. So it's true, people who make a plan to vote are more likely to cast a ballot. People who tell someone about that plan are even more likely to cast a ballot, and they're helping somebody else make a plan to vote as well. So this is the idea of vote tripling. Um, it's it's uh, kind of a, like a peer pressure applied to voting. And then, of course, over here, there's ways that you can imagine to even increase your impact more. If you're helping to register voters, you're, you're helping more voters do what they need to do to actually cast a ballot in an election. Um, I'm not going to shy away from saying um, donating to campaigns is impactful. It's very impactful, and donations of small sizes really do matter, particularly when donations are made directly to candidates in close races. And I also just want to say, although usually you're constrained to, well, always you're constrained to vote, you know, in your home district, donating to campaigns is one way to have an impact in close races that aren't in your district if you choose to do that. And then, of course, there's lots of ways you can help with campaigns. There's not so much door-to-door -door canvassing going on these days, but there's phone banks and campaigns need all kinds of help with um, publicity, just um, interacting with constituents, all sorts of things. But finally, let's get past voting, okay? So voting, of course, is incredibly important, but Policy making happens year round, not just during elections. So just two examples beyond voting. Um, lobbying sometimes is a word that has a, a negative connotation. So I'm gonna put the word citizen lobbying in front of it and try to get you maybe to not be so um, afraid of it or see it as something that somebody else does and not you. Lobbying is simply contacting the officials who represent you and building a relationship with them and, and holding them accountable, telling them what's important to you, these kinds of things. Direct engagement is, is really the most powerful way to do this. And a lot of groups will, have, will sponsor citizen lobby days where the representatives are all set up there to receive and meet, meet with you. I've been taking students to my state capitol here, and they're always really well received by members of both parties, by the way. Um, and um, it's a really good experience, and it's empowering um, for the students, too. And remember that the elected officials, this is part of their job and the job of their staff is to meet with people. So you can also make contact in other ways. Writing letters still has more of an impact than digital communication, but you can use digital com communication too. However you make contact, you, um, you make it personal, you be persistent, and um, make your message and the response that you get public as well. And if you can, do it in groups because it'll be more effective and probably more fun as well. Um, and then, of course, protest is up here. There's been a lot of protests lately. It's another form of political action, and it can have many purposes. Um, I think, you know, my, my advice on protests, and I studied protests for years, um, but as a, as a participant, if you're participating in protests, I think it's important to get it straight with yourself uh, why you're doing it, like what function it's serving for you, and even articulate that out loud. Um, 
it can be cathartic. It can be form of self-expression. It can be part of building a wider movement by helping people see they're not alone, that they're part of something bigger. But this is a talk about policy. So I like to take it to, it's, it's a way to pressure decision makers for a policy outcome or in the direction of a policy outcome. So I like to think strategically uh, about protest and, and this kind of engagement to that end. Um, it often will garner publicity. So if you're a participant, be ready for that. Practice and focus your message for the media um, and anybody else who cares to see or hear you, like, why are you doing this? What's this all about? And then don't let participation or protest be the end of your engagement. Work for change in other ways as well. Finally, if you really want to move upstream, and I think you should, you should consider becoming a policymaker yourself. Look at how many elected offices there are in the United States, over 500,000. Somebody has to fill these offices, right? Why not you? Um, running for office is challenging, of course, but the most important thing is that you have a compelling message or a reason why you want to do it and that you can mobilize some support and it often takes money, but local parties and groups are always trying to recruit candidates and help them build careers. And if running in an election seems daunting, keep a couple of things in mind. There's an awful lot of unelected boards and commissions and citizen committees that make consequential decisions, particularly on issues related to land use and development in cities and counties. And you don't have to run in elections often to serve on these boards and you'll be making really important policy. Um, another thing to think about is um, supporting people who are building careers as policymakers. So I've been in my community long enough now to have witnessed former students of mine nominate themselves to an unelected planning commission, then run for parks commissioner, then run for city council, then run for county council, sometimes lose, win, then run for state senator and just work their way up. See yourself as supporting policymaking careers over the long haul. Um, so not just as a voter, but a constituent, a donor, um, you know, supporting the people who are working upstream to shape things for us. And then for all of us, even active participation in non-governmental decision-making, like at schools or faith communities or workplaces or neighborhood groups, any forum where you're put in a role to make decisions on behalf of other people makes a difference and builds experience and resources for political participation. So ask yourself, where in the world do I have influence beyond myself? And you'll find some opportunities for that upstream leverage on policy. And so like Salmon, I guess I'm gonna bring it back to Salmon here, Go upstream to get more leverage, get the timing right, get the locale right, go in large numbers and multiply your impact, make a difference. And that's what I have for you tonight. Thanks. All right, thanks, Daniel. Um, there's a lot of questions that have come in and I'm gonna, we'll kind of do these a little rapid fire. Uh, and some of the questions that were asked, you anticipated or answered as we progressed. Uh, but one question from uh, Natalia is, uh, do you find she seems a little bit pessimistic that anything is going to change? So mm -hmm. do you find yourself that with that sense of pessimism or are you more optimistic about uh, uh, about policy changes taking place? I would definitely count myself on the optimistic side of things. You know, some of that might be my personality, but I think some of it is just um, paying close attention to policies at all levels. I think if you look, if you look at local and state levels, um, as well as the national level, um, you can, you can. If I think about where my optimism comes from, it comes from watching 
what my community has done, you know, over 17 years. And like I talked about, seeing policymakers develop their careers, seeing the way that they've shaped policy differently. Um, unfortunately, to be optimistic in that sense takes some patience because, um, you know, I just said it, that's 17 years in <laughs> watching right. that change, right? Right. Um, uh, so, and the other thing is, is, uh, you know, what good does it do to be pessimistic? <laughs> I guess it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help things along all that much. We want to be realistic, of course, but, um, you know. Okay. The next question is from Brooklyn and she wants to know, uh, who are some prevalent or widely known environmental politicians you admire and or activists in the United States? Maybe just name one if, if you can or more that make any difference to me. Um, well, I'm, um, I'm actually going to, I mean, it'd be somebody, it's not prominent. Okay. I'm going local. This is why I'm, I'm optimistic. So you, you know, you will not have heard of this guy, um, but he was a student here in my college, graduated in 2001. His name's Ryan Mello. And um, he's one of these people who worked his way up through lots of these local offices. But he designed this really cool policy instrument that was eventually passed, which, uh, gosh, how do I talk about this in a simple way? He arranged a kind of a banking system where a big problem here is suburban sprawl um, into farmland and forest land and, and how to conserve those lands. So he developed a system where farmers um, essentially can get paid to keep their land as farms by um, the developers who are developing in the city, which keeps the developers in the city and out of the farmland, and they, they build the city up in different ways. Anyway, I was really inspired by his like innovative approach. He also like just didn't hesitate to engage people who might not have wanted to sit around the, the you know, the same table. Um, How do you spell his last name? M-E-L-L-O. Okay, I typed that into the chat. Okay. Here's another question. This is from Shivani, and I think this has to do with your COVID uh, slide. He says, do you believe that the government is purposely overrepresenting non-white citizens to provide a higher privilege for those who are white? Could you say, I had trouble yeah. following the last Okay. Segment. said, do you believe that the government is purposely overrepresenting non-white citizens, I'm assuming in the COVID count, to provide a higher privilege for those who are white? Um. As far as, you know, I think, I think these counts uh, will evolve over time. So I have, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, work that's going to have to happen over the next two to three years to go back and work with this data and see mm -hmm. what's really happening. Because it's coming in right now in multiple ways from hospitals, not just one way. And, and different states and counties are reporting it differently. Um, I wouldn't be, I have no reason to be so skeptical that I think there's some malicious intent behind it. I think, I think that the numbers will firm up two to three years from now when we, we can, um, you know, get a better reading of what they represent. But okay. no, I mean, I don't have any good reason to, to, um, see malintent in the, in the reporting, I guess. Yeah. This next question is anonymous, but. The question is essentially, uh, doesn't livestock farming have the biggest ecological footprint? How can you take power away from a company such as a Monsanto, which holds a monopoly in the food market? Um, so livestock farming, it, you know, does have a, a tremendous footprint and all kinds of ecological harms. Um, that's correct. I think the heart of that question is how do you how you address an entity that's that powerful is that is that kind of correct yeah yeah so i mean that's in a nutshell i mean that that's why policy is important 
and that's why the absence of policy is important. So, so a corporation can get so big and powerful and have outsized impacts and not have to pay for those impacts in the absence of policies that, that force it to act in a certain way. So um, the policies for livestock farming need to change. They could be, for example, federalized. Like I said, mostly they're concentrate, most, most um, agricultural impacts that are on the land and the water and the air even are regulated at the state level. Well, agricultural interests, big agricultural interests have the most um, political influence at that level. So I think, you know, a more federalized approach could help. Here's a question on, uh, this is from Sharna. With a government that often ignores global warming, how can we help with the environment, especially with such, uh, with avid followers that also deny it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's hard and it can be, that can be dispiriting. So, <clears throat> Well, I mean, I'd be rem <laughs> look at what day of the month. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a vote for one thing. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, but do everything you do w with policy making in mind, um, not just voting, but contact with with whoever whomever is representing you as well. And again, just don't don't only think about the national level. A lot of um, climate impacts are are driven by decisions in uh, the cities and towns where we live um, the availability of public transportation the the way the streets are laid out you know how walkable things are um, these are these are local decisions and and a lot of times local decisions go to the people who show up mm-hmm Okay, well, Daniel, we, we've run over a little bit of time. Thank you for taking the extra time with us. We appreciate it very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating talk, giving us a lot to think about, especially uh, this time of the of a year in an election season. And uh, I have recorded this, everybody. And so this uh, will go out to your professors and uh, you can watch it again and again and again. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sherman. We appreciate it. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.